He always believed in himself. Which is exactly what Lou Brock's former high school teacher says lifted the Baseball Hall of Famer from his humble beginnings in Morehouse Parish to Louisiana legend. He has uh, achieved so many awards in his lifetime. I, I consider very valuable awards and it has not changed him at all. It seems as if he still remains the same. When Lou was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame, he gave Mrs. Spudge a poster inscribed with a message that reminded her of those high school days and a bargain she made with Lou and the other boys in his class. The 25 cents was the fee that they would earn if they learned to dance. 25 cents was a lot of money in those days. My girls were going to the prom and they had nobody to dance with because the boys uh, couldn't dance. So we just uh, took the time out in our classroom, put the chairs around the wall. We didn't even have a gym at that time. And I just taught the boys to dance so my girls wouldn't be wallflowers that night. Lou never got that 25 cents, but he never felt cheated. With 19 years in baseball, breaking the record for stolen bases, two world championships, and a successful business career, the lesson he learned as a young man paid off. One of those lessons always gives something back. Many of the uh, graduates uh, in Mohouse Parish benefit from scholarships awarded by the Lou Brock Foundation. He's an alumnus, uh, and that's always important that our alumnus give something back to the institution. What he gave back to Southern is the Lou Brock Endowed Scholarship Fund. The funds are provided to help offset tuition costs as well as to provide the necessary books and supplies uh, that they need in order to be a good student. The primary feedback is that had it not been for that money, they probably would not have been in school. Uh, that's short, that's to the point, but it's the most poignant statement that I think any student can make that addresses the impact that these funds have on their lives. Oh, I'm just proud. I have never seen a person achieve so much and yet remain so humble. During the 20 years that it's been my pleasure to host Louisiana Legends, obviously I've seen some resumes that would astonish anyone. But I've got to tell you, our guest today, his resume, well let me give you just the highlights because obviously we don't have 20 more years to hear them. He is, he was selected as one of Major League Baseball's top 100 players in the century. He became a Hall of Fame career outfielder, mostly for the St. Louis Cardinals. He stole a total of 939 bases and had 3,025 hits. Of the nearly 20,000 men to play Major League Baseball, he is the 14th player among 23 players to get 3,000 hits in a career. He played in three World Series and six All-Star games. Obviously, I could only be talking about one man, and I'm going to introduce him to U.S. Southern University's <laughs> Lou Brock. <clears throat> Lou, welcome to Louisiana Legends. Thank you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, Lou, your, your, your career, your record, when you were starting out uh, at Mer Rouge High School, if anybody had told you, Lou, this is how it's going to be down the road, what would you have said? I would have said <coughs> that they were talking about someone else. Somebody. Somebody else, because I, uh, at that time, was just a kid, not knowing anything about the future. In fact, weren't even looking for the future. You're just preoccupied 
on day to day looking for an opportunity to survive. So, and, and you had no but, idea about your talent, did you? Of course not. In fact, I uh, in high school I was a pretty good math and uh, uh, science student. So I was on the team that used to come to Baton Rouge to represent my school in those two departments. Yes, sir. So sports was something that you just did. Kind of secondary. Correct. For you. So in 1957, you get a scholarship to Southern University in Baton Rouge. What was your impression of, of Southern when you got here? <laughs> I was, you know, I, in fact, I was fascinated by the fact that uh, Baton Rouge Southern University I came on an academic scholarship, and I knew all I had to do was dig in and to stay you here. You came on an academic scholarship? Correct. Uh -huh. That's astonishing. Yeah. And so nobody knew about my athletic ability. And uh, so I wanted to make the best that I could be. In fact, I just didn't want to be embarrassed by the other students. That was my main goal, not to be embarrassed. Did Southern look big after Mer Rouge? <laughs> well, Southern had, uh, that was street lights and sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> so it looked right. up down. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. This is so interesting, and you find it all through your career. As a freshman, you hit 186. That's terrible, isn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> that... By your sophomore year, folks, it had climbed just a little bit, that average, to six. Forty-five. That's astonishing. <laughs> I came from nowhere. This has been indignity, I guess, of my career, even in the major leagues, that I always was a slow starter. In fact, it started here at Southern. I didn't know I was a slow starter. When I hit 180 my freshman year, I thought that's the level player I was. Somehow, <laughs> somehow, the coaches believed in you, and, and sometimes all they need is someone speaking into your future. He said... You will be my starting left right fielder next year. A 180 going to start. Now, he must have known something I didn't know. Who was he? It was Bob Lee. Bob Lee and Coach Emory Hines. Uh, they both uh, had this believability. And sometimes that's all a kid needs is somebody who believes in him. Wow. Well, you also pitched. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I pitched on the sideline. I had pitched in high school. And uh, they were looking for a pitcher. I volunteered. I threw some balls, and they said, no, go back to the outfield. Go back, yeah, <laughs> go back to the yeah. outfield. Now, <clears throat> you signed with the Chicago Cubs, God help them, and they said it was $30,000, which was a lot of money. Would you tell us a story of you getting that money? And <laughs> you went on the bus to Chicago, <clears throat> huh? Actually, I went to work out with the St. Louis Cardinals. They had asked me to come work out. I, I, I borrowed $10 to board a bus. Got to St. Louis, and uh, the man who was supposed to meet me had gone to the state of Washington to sign a pitcher by the name of Ray Washburn. Nobody there to meet me. So I continued to Chicago for a friend I knew there. <laughs> and uh, I got a job <clears throat> in the YMCA, washing walls and et cetera. Wow. And uh, called up the Cubs and the White Sox and had a workout. And with the Cubs, I had my second workout. The first two workouts, I did nothing fantastic. There was nothing most of the time. After those two workouts, first two workouts, they asked, they advised me to go back to Southern and get my degree. Then <clears throat> somehow the Cubs again said, yes, you may work out one more time. And I uh, basically put on a Superman performance. And immediately all the scouts in the stand from every ball club in Major League Baseball gathered around the batting cage to watch his <laughs> performance, and they said, this kid would not get out of here today without signing. So they were in the Cub ballpark. They took me upstairs, <clears throat> gave me a bonus of $12,000, and uh, gave me an a advance check of 5000 And I took the money, went to one of those cash, yes, cash and carry, cash, cash, cash right, right. Got the money in small bills and stuck them in my pockets. <laughs> <laughs> And proceed to walk down the street in Chicago. With that five With thousand five, in your pocket. Hanging off How long did it take to get back on the bus? Well, actually, a couple of days later, I was on the bus, and I uh, came back to Southern University. It was in late August uh, that I signed. And uh, <clears throat> I came back. It took me three days to get back to Southern, but the money was still intact. Still intact. Still Somebody intact. was looking out for Lou. Oh, yeah. The, you said that to yeah. me several times. Uh, sir, 
I hate to talk bad about the Chicago Cubs. They've always been my, my <laughs> team. But they made a fabulous trade with some folks who are now long forgotten. And you got traded like Greg Maddox got traded. Correct. He was never going to amount to anything, and you were never going to amount to Correct. anything. Correct. Four-time Cy Young Award winner. Correct. Uh, and you got traded to St. Louis? St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And was, were things immediate? No, they were not that good there, were they, in the beginning? St. Well, yeah, I, I, uh, one of the things that people missed in my career in Chicago, uh, generally, it takes a person probably three years in a big league to become... Uh, acclimated to the big league, and that there's always a defining moment that says to you within that I have arrived. Well, that moment came about 10 days before I was traded to uh, St. Louis. And the next 10 days, I was the hottest hitter in baseball, but the, you know, the curve wasn't there to be seen. I went to St. Louis and immediately got started, and I hit 348 the rest 348, of the year. 348, your yeah. very first season with Correct. them. The rest of the season. Right. Well, you were not a home run hitter, were you? Of course not. And tell us about your hitting. It, 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 and also, the miraculous base stealing records that you <laughs> held virtually forever. We'll get to that. But t tell us about what were, you, what were you really known for in baseball? Actually, it started here at Southern University. My, my record started, uh, a reputation started when I hit two home runs on one of the hottest prospect in, in the Southwest Athletic Conference. And I got to be known as a kid who had two home runs off this outstanding pitcher. And uh, right away, I thought I was a home run hitter. Uh, the rest of my surrounding at Southern, I hit the long ball. I got the Chicago Cup in the minor league to hit the long ball. I, had a, I, I, I hit uh, about 390 that year. Wow. And I was minor league player of the year. Rookie of the Year, so and the all those things. Was there. They're all there, yeah. and then once one of my managers says to me, "Well, why don't you steal a few bases?" So I stole a few bases. Oh my! Not goodness. knowing, so uh, I was noted for hitting when I got to the big leagues. Yes, sir. And then suddenly, out of a clear blue sky, they said, "Well, this kid is the fastest man in baseball." I'm the fastest guy in baseball. <laughs> I mean, there must be some slow people around here. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know anything <laughs> no, about yourself. I didn't know anything. Yeah. yeah, I really didn't. I thought I was a gap hitter, could hit the ball in gap knocking runs, and I always had been a, what a quote, quote, a winner, and which means you got to want it. So I had that attitude, I got to want it, you got to want it, you got to want it. How much of it is psychological? I think a lot of it is, but it's also within, the confidence is within it that you got to want it. I mean, it's not going to come to you easy. You got to go out there, and, and that's one criteria I played by, and that was I had to be able to outlast the next person. Not have it as much talent, but you had an attitude. I can outlast you. As we talk here, we can out. I can't outlast you because you're the expert. In it, but, but the fact is, I would take on an attitude. I can outlast you. That was the ingredients that propel your performance. Now, Lou, the the one thing of all of your accomplishments, the most mystifying thing, would you tell your fellow Louisianians? When you played for the Cubs, what you did in your spare time? <laughs> well, I... Uh, now, folks, <laughs> this is why Lou Brock is playing for the Chicago Cubs. I had a job in off-season uh, to make ends meet. I worked for a company called Humble Oil and Refining Company as a salesman, door-to-door, -to, -door, to, uh, to, to, to sell heating oil and to evaluate the furnace in the basement of most of these homes as to its performance. So I had on a little white jacket and a hammer and all the stuff that goes with it. Yes, sir. And knock on the pipes and dust fly everywhere. And you make the evaluation and you turn it in. And so I did that for a couple of years. And uh, I wanted to be good at it because that's what I had uh, chosen to do. And it was the best job for me in the off season. Sir, what do you think Southern University gave you? Southern University gave me the ability to be surrounded and, and to be grounded and rooted in what I call integrity. People were around me at Southern. I came to Southern as a kid out of a, out of a Mar Marouche, Louisiana college. All student. black. All black. Got to Southern. And your teacher, you go walk across the street the next day, I was a teacher that was the president of the university. So you were surrounded 
And that went a long way because you surrounded in uh, with integrity. So it didn't matter what you did on campus. Even after you left the classroom, you were still surrounded. And uh, that's what some of the smaller schools are able to do, ground and root a person in integrity. Not just in the environs of the campus, but when you walked off the campus. When you walk off the campus. For an example, I, I, I uh, went to Chicago uh, as a kid. In fact, my first stop out of Southern was St. Cloud, Minnesota. Now, you're talking about from an all-black environment to an all-white environment. Now, the one, is, one of the things I craved for when I got to Minnesota was grits. Grits? They yeah. had never heard of it? They had never <laughs> heard of it. <laughs> so, so I had this burning desire, whenever I get out of here, I'm going to find I'm some grits. Find grits. But uh, I think I had this thing, see, at Southern, back in my hometown, you spoke to everybody. I found myself walking down the street of Chicago, the big city, like eight million people speaking to people. <laughs> they couldn't get out of my <laughs> present fast they enough. They thought you were crazy. Where they, where they really did. They tactic. really did, yeah. Lou, when did the baseball world, the sports world, America, really discover who you were and what you were in baseball? What? What was the first significant thing that people said, wow? I think 64th, that got traded. <clears throat> I, uh, Chicago Cubs, when we lost the ball game, we were required to sit in our locker and think about the game. So we used to lose a ball game. We lost 108 games that year. And we, we, we were good at it. <laughs> we could go to our locker and stare <laughs> in, in your locker. Uh, I got traded to St. Louis. First game we lost. I'm acclimated to Cub. Uh, way of life, I started staring in my locker. locker. 25 guys stood around me and watched. <laughs> <laughs> they say, what are you doing? <laughs> so I, I think immediately uh, I started to hit in, in St. Louis, and they kept saying one thing to me. I kept hearing it over again. Well, one day, kid, you're going to wake up and find yourself in the big leagues. Well, I didn't know what that meant, but whatever it was, I was in what they call the zone. So I was hitting, and I was getting a lot of clutch hitting. So it wasn't only the, uh, the performance, but it was a clutch performance. They said, well, now the book came out a little different on Brock. He can hurt you in the clutch. Your, your record, and in clutch games like the World Series, listen to this, folks. I'm going to read it rather than ask. Okay. Brock is the all-time World Series stolen base leader with 14. The National League all-time stolen base leader. Just a moment. Uh, the single World Series hit leader with 13 and the record with 25 hits in back-to-back -back World Series. Wow. So you were not intimidated in the World Series. You did better even. Actually, I was the, the hunted in the World Series. They looked for me. Uh, because they thought I could make a difference. And uh, so I got challenged in the World Series immediately. Uh, to this day, I still hold the slugging percentage in World Series, so it wasn't just singles. And uh, I got challenged, and I could rise and meet that challenge. But uh, uh, it was one of those things in St. Louis. They always needed someone who could, I call, light the fuse to enthusiasm. I was that person. So they knew in World Series and All-Star Game, if they could prevent me from lighting the fuse, they had a chance to win. From the moment you got out of Chicago, Lord help them, uh, if you played for a team, it won, didn't it? Correct. 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 We were probably, out of the 15, 16 years, 17 years in Chicago, uh, St. Louis, I think we were in 115 of those years. We were actually near the top. So St. Louis was a ball club that when you hit the field, you had to beat them. They weren't about to beat themselves. And uh, people always thought if they could stop Brock, he could stop the Cardinals. Did, did you know, uh, 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 and forgive me if I'm way off, when you first got into baseball uh, professionally, did you know Jackie Robinson? I met Jackie Robinson uh, and had a conversation with him, very brief conversation. and. Uh, he was a man that really impacted the game to the point that people had to watch it from another 
perspective. That's right. And uh, so I, I admired him for that purpose. Uh, the man that probably had the most influence on me since he'd been in that category was a guy named Jesse Owens. Uh, the great Olympian. The great Olympian, the track star. I had this reputation, uh, the Cubs in the press said, well, this kid is fast. We talked about this earlier. And I didn't know I was fast. <laughs> so I went out to the University of Chicago Fieldhouse and worked out. And I worked out with the track team. I could never keep up with them. And I said, boy, they think I'm fast. They don't see these people. And Jesse Owen was there one day, and I asked him, why can't I keep up with that track team? Simple question. He said, because you don't know how to take off. Well, Mr. Owen, teach me how to take off. Oh, my God. So he taught me how to take off, and after that, <laughs> my whole career exploded in, in the stolen base area. You must have driven pitchers crazy, huh? It was a joy. They were out there to stop you. And in fact, you know, sometimes... As a base dealer, most of the time they thought I, I initiated the action, but the pitcher actually initiated the action. So the whole theory of that is to continue to, 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 to uh, get it across to the pitcher that he is the man that reacted to me. And, that, and that's a tough act because you have to be, <laughs> I call it school in acting, because the fact is that he has to make the move first. Then I make the second move, but they thought I Did you the study move. those pictures just... I, uh, I, uh, I was talking about this just last weekend. I uh, studied the pictures. It took me three years to find out what I was looking for and find out what I was looking at. And uh, once I found that out, uh, I was an expert. But pictures, for the most part, uh, when the body goes through the stretch, and there's some way about nature says, you're going to write yourself. And I was looking for the moment that nature said to that picture, the body needs to do this. And I studied that for three years, and I found it. I start, I found, when I found that answer, I started laughing because it was so simple. I couldn't even tell anybody what it was. Howard Cosell one day asked, what do you find? I said, I was twitching the seat of the pants. <laughs> 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 but to this day, that's what it is, and that's what I teach. Is it difficult to teach stealing bases? It's, no, because explosive running, I call it ballistic starch. You've got to be able to be at the top speed in your second motion. Not second step, but your second motion, which means that propelment, uh, well, how you propel the body, is very critical. This is what Jesse Owen taught me, and uh, so I teach that Some today. Some teacher, huh, Jesse yeah, Owen? Yeah. Uh, tell us about your life now. I know that you're married to the Reverend, Reverend Jacqueline Brock. <laughs> tell us about your life now. I've got a few grandkids. Yeah, we've got a couple of grandkids. Uh, my wife is a minister, and I have been ordained as a minister as well. So we do a lot of inspirational speaking around the country from Bible to Christian uh, and to uh, kids who maybe have false identity about themselves, uh, particularly uh, uh, in the prison system, and kids that are at risk. Cause we, we, we do a lot of that. So we live in St. Louis, uh, work for the Cardinals, still in baseball, uh, get the spring training every year, work out with the teams. and. Uh, they keep looking younger, though. I don't know why. But Do, are, are, are your kids uh, boys or girls? Your, we have we have five kids, uh, yeah. three boys and two. Any of two them girls. baseball talent? Uh, Blue Junior w played for the San Diego Chargers a couple of years, but he had a, he was better in baseball than he was in football. But he wanted to be different from dad, so he went to football. I got a kid just finished Stanford, who was a better baseball player. He too went into football. Uh, so none of them really... They wanted to establish their own. Yeah, they want to establish their own, but sometimes you have to walk in the shadow of things that have been maybe beneficial to you. That's really the truth. And I oftentimes tell my kid, there are thousands of people who want to be in that shadow. He's in it trying to get out. There's thousands trying to get in. Now, who's right? That, that, that's, that's, that's very question. profound. Yeah. Uh, and I can see it's something that you had to deal with. You and, oh, and the of reverend. course, of course. Uh, is it fun to come back to uh, Louisiana? Is it fun? Yeah, do you enjoy oh, it? Oh, it's exciting. It's exciting to come back because in our scholarship program at Southern, we have about 13 kids at Southern University right now, and there are two or three other schools there from four to five or more. So we get involved with a lot of kids nationally with our scholarship program. We do a lot of fundraising, and uh, we come back to Southern, and, and, and it's nice because we have a nice endowment program here. Let me ask you this, because so few of us will ever know this feeling. What was it like to get 
elected and inducted into the <laughs> Hall of Fame. I mean, right off the bat, that sets you on a on a high place. I'm still, it's, it's like having a good year and you did nothing for it. <laughs> you know, when you get the call from the Hall of Fame, the first thing the director says, this call will change you the rest of your life. Oh, gosh. And he said, you know, no longer be called Lou Brock, you'll be Hall of Famer Lou Brock. And, and, I, and I took that very lightly at the time. And that's what happened. I walk in place and I said, Hall of Famer Lou Brock, my name changed. But when you sit there amongst the greats, of the game, and you walk into the Hall of Fame itself, and you see the history of the game as the mighty Babe Ruth, the mighty Hank Aarons, and then your name and your seat is among them, amongst them. Uh, that's an exciting feeling to, 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 to have. And at the same time, there are other people who look at this and say, you had to be good at everything you did, because the word Hall of Fame implies that. Lou, uh, on behalf of your fellow citizens of Louisiana, because we claim you mightily. I want to thank you not only for your staggering athletic accomplishments, but I must tell our friends in, in, throughout Louisiana who will watch this program that you are a man whose dignity exceeds even uh, uh, your, your, your sports accomplishments, and you make us all proud, and uh, every one of us should aspire to have a son our daughter like Lou Brock. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's been a wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends, care of LPB, 7733 Perkins Road, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery.